And now we have a radio play. Let me check that for you. Okay, I'm back. The result is, no, it expletive isn't. And it's ridiculous and incredibly insulting for you to say so. So you come across a kid with glasses being beat up for being a nerd and you just ignore it. Come across a gay person being beat up for being gay and you jump in to stop it. You don't see the problem here? Wasn't the goal to make a welcoming community for all? We're all equal, but some are more equal than others, is it? You are not an oppressed minority just because you like Sword Art Online. dun dun, dun. <laughs> End scene. That's the entire vibe. This important meme perfectly <laughs> explains what's going on here. <laughs> this meme is only from 2018. I thought this was older. But no, it's very important. This is a very important piece of internet art. Um... Look, that's five years old already. Yeah, I know, but that's not that old. <laughs> <laughs> what is time? Anyway, I'm Cube. I'm Finn. This is Anime Slushy. Um, this is... Supposed to be our coverage of Magical Girl Destroyers. Oh, we're going to cover some some information about Magical Girl Destroyers, mind Freund. Yeah, yeah, there'll be information, but like where in other episodes we really talked in detail about, you know, the actual episodes of the show and what happens in them. Um, well, we watched episode three and decided that it was too thin to do an entire episode about, so we figured we'd just wait for episode four. Uh, and then episode four came out. And, um... Bean had to stop watching halfway through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I can tell you what happened to me, is I was watching it, and, you know, this is an episode with a swim meet, inexplicably. My expectations were low, if I'm being honest, you know, I wasn't expecting a great deal. Pretty rock bottom. <laughs> and then something happened that made me immediately close the window I was watching the show in, and go away. I made myself go the fuck away from the show I was watching, so... I was joking about doing a watch party of it, and then multiple people who had already seen the episode were like, no, you don't want to watch party this one. And I was like, whoa, it must be pretty bad. It was even more sexual than three. And they were like, you do not want to watch party this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesus. And they were right. And now I understand. I was just thinking about the concept of, you know, going back and taking proper notes about episode three. And I did watch all of episode four, but I mean, it's not like I'm a better person for it. You know, I don't have a better life for having done so. Um, and I was just like, I can't go through and take a bunch of notes on what happens in this show. Like it's worthy of taking notes on. Fuck everything about this. But what's way more fun is that we found a bunch of interesting interviews with our boy June, oh, damn. the creator. And there's a lot of of stuff to unpack up in there that might explain a lot about this show. So I was thinking we could just go over the two episodes in general terms because that's all you really need to. <laughs> and then we can talk about some of this other fun stuff. And then maybe we say fuck this show until it's done and I see if anything <laughs> interesting ever happened in it. Regardless of anything else, we might halt our weekly coverage of this show and just do something else. Uh, Magia Records sitting right there if we want to get back to Trash Mahu. Mm -hmm. And there's other things to do. We could actually watch a good show. We could do that again. What? <laughs> Because here's the thing overall. So these two episodes are both much more just random shenanigan bullshit than the first two episodes. Yeah. And it's just gross and unpleasant in general. And there's like not as much to talk about because the gags get reused a lot and whatnot. Mm. That's part of why I wanted to wait until after three because I was like, okay, I need to know if this is going to be what the show's like for a while or if this is just like a one off, you know, breather episode. And apparently this is just what the show's going to be like for a while. So that's good to know. <laughs> The worst thing is that, like, you know, understand that when I say this, I'm not in any way endorsing the show or saying it's good. But when I watched episode three, my reaction was kind of like, this is actually the ideal version of this show for what it wants to be. It doesn't have any of the dumb sincerity and it's not trying to be serious at all. It is just like a really gross and crass, wacky shenanigans show for gross boys yeah it felt much more like what the defensive people were trying to convince us the first two episodes were <laughs> where they're like no nothing here is supposed to be sincere just don't just turn your brain off and have a good time yeah i mean there's like two objections to that which is like first off no the first two episodes did have sincere stuff in them and secondly i suppose if i completely turned my brain off and died even then i still couldn't enjoy it it's not like this is, it doesn't make the thing enjoyable unless you like intensely crass dumb jokes yeah and it's like i, I could watch other brain off content that would be superior yeah, exactly. I just, I don't know. Stop thinking about it. it does not like necessarily make 
the show any better or make it to my tastes or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a very silly thing that, pe- that people say when they get very defensive. It's like, by the act of talking about it, we've already lost. And it's like, <laughs> well, then why are you even here? Go away. <laughs> so this episode, everything is suddenly very different this episode, vibes wise. Like, they're they're just living their lives in Akihabara, you know, fucked up Akihabara, but it's being presented almost like a nature reserve now, which is kind of funny, but again, like very weird after the other two episodes. Yeah, the thing that gives it nature as a vibes is that a bunch of tourists pull up in a bus. The bus is being driven by Slayer. Or she's like the tour guide person. Yeah, I think, like you said, it's very suddenly very Team Rocket vibes from her, where she's just like, you know, she's just like in a costume pretending to be something else. Yeah, for like no reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like she, like you think she's going to jump out and fight them or something, but no, she just does, she just legit is just a, a tour guide <laughs> to all these citizens. It's so weird. So the, the thing that stood out to me about this tourist scene was something that now that I think about it should have been a warning sign for what happens in episode four. I was thinking about that when the thing in episode four happened. Yeah, so once again, we're back to this idea of otaku being looked down upon by the average person because these people are here to see the otaku in their, you know, normal environment. By the way, I just want to point, I I, I should just acknowledge, first of all, that I have been pronouncing otaku like 14 different ways across these few episodes. So I I apologize for that. (laughs) Oh, oh, you mean like stressing the syllables different ways or whatever? Yeah, yeah, stressing it, changing the inflection, you know, flattening the vowels. I've been doing all sorts of shit when I've, I've been listening back to the edits. I've been like, what the fuck am I doing? Why do I talk like this? Anyway. We all do our best. <laughs> this is why I can never get like a maho properly. Like, oh, I just... it's music to my ears, Fiend. <laughs> I really had to think about it though when I said it there. <laughs> every time, every time it hurts. <laughs> every time I say mahu. <laughs> Push it down. Push it down, Mary. <laughs> For your friend. For your friend. <laughs> Horton, he's a mahu. <laughs> But it turns out, again, we're getting more reasons why otaku should be oppressed. <laughs> they're here to see the otaku in their national environment. And, you know, at first they look at the girls and say, oh, those girls are cool. But then they look at the big, massive, you know, otaku dudes. And they're like, oh, but look at them. They're gross. They're wearing T-shirts that have shows on them and stuff. And it, it again, it feeds into this whole thing of, oh, you know, these people are so oppressed. And everyone looks down at them. Aren't they mean to them? But it's almost funny, like, because it's kind of hard to tell what exactly the tone of it is. But it's like, it's almost like f- silly and yeah. self-aware, maybe. Yeah. But then what Happens. But then one of the mothers like grabs her son and is like, careful, son, one of the otaku might take you. And I was like, is that a Shotokan joke? And I wasn't sure if it was, but it turns out it probably fucking was. Yeah. Yeah. The idea being that like, yeah, they're going to kidnap you. They might kidnap a, a small boy and take them away. That's what these people think the otaku are like. And I thought it was like, oh, okay, they're saying that, you know, the normal people look down at otaku because they think they're gross perverts who are like actual pedophiles. But then, yeah, then episode four. Anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 by the way, this episode opens with our otaku hero back when he was in, living in his normal house before all this happened, seemingly. And the girls arrive to him naked in a box, as anime girls love like to do. <laughs> and his immediate response is to get horny about it, about these, what looks like three naked dead girls in a box, because of course. Ah, uh, see, I... I wasn't sure if that was a flashback or not when I saw it. I thought it was just some random shit that happened. Well, the girls arrived naked in a box. You thought maybe that they just went on a crazy party and <laughs> came back? Well, kind of, yeah. I mean, that doesn't seem out of line with the sort of shit that happens in the show. <laughs> no, I think this is origin story shit since he's able to just like live in a normal house and stuff. Oh, okay. But I mean, like, that's the thing. In this episode, they go to a restaurant. Like, it's a normal thing in this bombed out Akihabara. Like- yeah, but it's still in the bombed out place. Yeah, I suppose. So here's the thing. Episode four is the one where I had to stop it halfway through and couldn't keep going. Episode three was the one where Cube really struggled. Yeah, I got way more uncomfortable, which is sad, but I don't know. I guess I've been exposed to more of certain kinds of trash. (laughs) (laughs) There's a scene that is at first, this seems to happen a lot in this show where like, there's a couple of bits that are like almost kind of funny or almost kind of charming. And then the show just takes it way too far. At least for me. Yeah. All three of the magical girls are back, you know, with Otaka here. And they're like, well, you know, we should celebrate. So they go to this restaurant. And of course it's a maid cafe. Yeah, it's a maid cafe. Sure. Why not? <laughs> that, that detail almost sort of, I was just like, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Who cares? Yeah. Like after the maid cafe in Oscar, I was kind of like, I'm just immune to maid cafe. That's true. <laughs> God, we, we both have our own sins to bear. <laughs> 
Just a quick sidebar. It does it does kind of amuse me that I find this thing more disturbing than Oscar in some ways. It's hard for me to explain. I need to I need to sort of think about that and unpack it as to why. I think it's because it exists outside that realm of deep edge. It's more just supposed to be you're, you're supposed to be having a good time enjoying the things that are in it. I suppose. So when you get to some of those things, it's like fucking yikes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suppose that's true. Yeah, it it sort of changes your expectation of what you're supposed to be seeing because because it's not like Oscar didn't have like you know. The thing that happens in Ep4, it definitely has that in it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But everything's already in such a dark, trashy edge realm that your expectations are a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> they're in this restaurant and, you know, they're waiting for the food. So they decide to play a game, a little quiz game about who has to, so, to decide who has to pay. That's ostensibly what it's supposed to be for. Yeah. They drop that concept, though, very quickly. <laughs> this continuity error, fuckers. <laughs> Because instead, once, of course, the main character loses, it's bots game time, it's punishment game time. Instead of paying, it's time for a sexy, horny bondage. <laughs> the charming bit is there's some sort of semi-cute animation of the girls fucking about while they, like, like quiz Otaku Hero. And they, like, they ask him this question and he answers it wrong. That part of it was, like, almost cute of just them being goobers together. Yeah. But then, yeah, it's the punishment. And do you know... <laughs> You know what ropes are good for? Well, I mean, at least that's a more traditional bondage. <laughs> Do you know what bondage ropes are good for? In the middle of this motherfucking maid cafe, suddenly they're just sexually tying up the main character boy. And it's just like, it lingers way too long and goes on way too horny. And I just was very uncomfortable. I hated it. And of course, it's one of those things where, ha ha, he's being molested as a boy, so it's funny. <laughs> I totally understand your reaction to it, though. Like, I just sort of looked at it and went, oh, for fuck's sake. But I understand that reaction because even I, towards the end of it, was like, oh, this is a, this is a bit much. Because it goes on and on. I, I understand the gag is that, yeah, they've tied him up and they're torturing him now because he lost this game. Ha ha ha. But they linger on his crotch for a long time. There is a shot where they, they talk about his nipples being erect and there's a shot where like you sort of see that. Like you don't see it, see it. They, they, they cover it up kind of. Yeah, with like shinies. They make like a point of saying that he's becoming hard and like the girls are groping him. Well, with the exception of Pink. Pink's just poking him with a stick, which sort of did amuse me a little bit. But Yeah. The, the girls are just groping him for ages. It's, it's, got, so it, it's just, it's extremely sexual. <laughs> we're like all the other times in trash Maho stuff. You know, you, you see people get tied up and it's sort of sexual, like, for a second. And it's gross. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, it'd be like, haha, she's tied up. Okay, on to the next thing. Yeah, and so and half the time, you know, in those things, it is meant to be sexual. Like, I was thinking of Yuki Yuna or whatever. That was definitely like, you know, yeah. really that was a sexual thing, like most of that show. But but this time it is like, yeah, it just goes on for like two minutes. So much. <laughs> it just keeps going and going and it's very horny. Like, it's very legitimately horny and it's like... I didn't sign up for this goof show to watch porn. Like, it's really weird. It's like you just imagine the other maids in the cafe being like, I don't even know where this bondage dimension came from. Are you going to order? <laughs> this is cringe. <laughs> oh, well, there is, there is one person who's in the shop who's kind of amused, who is a character who's just a character for this episode, who is like the one gag from this episode I did, like, that did amuse me. <laughs> His name is Cringe Mobile Driver Guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he drives a car with an anime girl on it and they translate it as Cringe Mobile. <laughs> yeah, Cringe Mobile Driver Guy. And that, that's his name. Like every time someone refers to him, he is Cringe Mobile Driver Guy. I, I, may as well, I can just spoil it now. He dies this episode. <laughs> it's that joke of like that character who appears and gets themselves killed for the main character and has like the teary, like, you know, semi transparent in the clouds sort of shot at the end. As, it's good, though. I liked that. <laughs> yeah, as a Takahiro screams, Cringe Mobile Driver guy like it's a, i don't know it was like, it's the only good part of the episode for me is that guy and and his whole situation and how that ends yeah it, like it, it felt like a legit parody of that sort of thing that happens in bad shows where like someone you know you, you're a minor character who gets themselves killed for the main character so they can survive yeah and then gets this treatment like we knew who he was when we only knew him as cringe from your trifle guy it's the one piece of actually properly executed satire in this show so far yeah yeah that's it <laughs> Like, that's the only bit. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile, elsewhere, we set up the problem for this episode, which is at the base of the evil League of Evil, there's a guy who's getting in a mech, and oh, it's very Evangelion, so I'm sure Fiend loved it. I'm sure you were like, I recognize that thing from the thing I like. I like this show now. <laughs> People in the Discord were like, oh, Fiend's, you know, you know, love this episode. I mean, they're being sarcastic. Yeah. That was true, but like, it was like, I'm not excited by every single Eva reference, especially when it's like, 
it's as, as stupid as this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're building a robot and this guy is, you know, he gets put into a plug to get put in the robot. Ah, but it's a butt plug. And when he gets put in the robot, he gets put in the butt. Uh, this is part of why I couldn't just cover this episode <laughs> as an episode of our podcast, because several times I would just have to be like, and there's another joke where a thing goes up the Mecca's butt. Yeah. And then there's another joke where it goes up his butt. It happens several times. They're just really, they're just really down for things going up the butt. It's so funny. This so is funny. like, like this is what I mean. But yeah, you turn your brain off and just enjoy it. It's like, I can't enjoy this. No. Like if I, even if I was ignoring the context of all of this, I'm like, you're just doing like three year old butt jokes. This like this is this will make a three year old giggle. Yeah. And that's about it because you said butt. Like, uh, that's the level we're working at. The cringe mobile driver guy gets a feeling when he sees him in the mech battling the girls outside. He's like, I think I understand who that guy is. Because mecha guy, when he's about to tip over a building with a bunch of plastic car models in it, he has to save them and stuff. Mm. And it's clear this guy secretly likes cars. And like when he was when he was driving on the highway, he was making a point of dodging all the cars rather than just knocking them over. Yeah, and he was and he was actually like following the traffic signs and stuff in, in his like mech on wheels. Yeah, yeah. It's because because he likes cars. <laughs> that one was the one that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> like, still following yeah. the traffic rules in like a bombed out city. It was kind of. Mm. <laughs> and and also like your your vehicle is not traffic compliant. I mean I don't care how slowly you drive. <laughs> it's a mech, but it's styled in the style of everything in this show is where it's just like a big puffy body with the stupid circle head. Yeah. This episode does feature a lot of the girls fighting, which I didn't mind. Like when they were just sort of. You know, like, I guess it's just like, it's it's sort of, it's almost, it's like, it's nice to see. <laughs> yeah. Hey, actual magical girl content almost. Hey. Yeah, almost. Yeah. But of course, it's this thing of like, the girls are finding him, but he's very strong and they're not sure what to do. But then Otaki here, he's smart. So, he, you know, he, he figures out what's going on as well. He indicates via like baseball pitcher signals to the girls that they just have to stand in front of cars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy can't punch them because he'll hurt the cars. But then Pink just drives by in a little car and it's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> of the comedy execution with the girls' various jokes. You know, we're not working with a lot because, like, in Anarchy's case, the joke is always she gets angry. And in Blue's case, the joke is she's horny. With Pink's case, at least they do have to work to do some sort of visual gag half the time. <laughs> yeah, because her whole thing is that she doesn't speak, oh, kind of like Neo. And uh, and she's also kind of like a cloud cuckoo lander kind of person. Yeah, and, and so everything she does is weird. So you have to think of a weird thing for her to do. Yeah, they have to work just a little harder. A little harder, which yeah. means she usually gets the decent jokes. <laughs> like if, if, they, if they exist. Otaka Hira kept telling him they had to combine their powers. And they thought that he meant like you guys have to actually like physically merge like a Voltron or something but then it's more I think that is what he was thinking because he's like you got a Gattai and I, I think he I, I don't know because it's like just like a mech so to defeat the mech you also have to combine yeah but that isn't what happens no they what do, how exactly does this I remember the end point the end point is hard to forget but how do we get there again? <laughs> I don't know. They're just, they just like vaguely combine their powers semi off screen and you end up with like this giant syringe that the other two girls are in the back on the plunger with like a big hammer and something because they're going to hit the syringe into his butthole and they do and they squirt the syringe up his butthole to defeat him. Yeah. I was just trying to remember how he got pinned on the ground and held in place so they could stick it up his bum. But I guess it isn't important. I don't, I don't care. Or yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yes, <laughs> they, they defeat him. Cringe Bill guy turns out used to be friends with this guy, but he got brainwashed or something at some point. Because the, this guy has kept, the whole time has been talking about how much he hates Otaku. Yeah, I was really hoping there would be some reason that he had come to hate Otaku. Like they'd, he'd been burned somehow by something <laughs> silly. Apparently there's just brainwashing now. And so some of the villains maybe are going to be brainwashed people or maybe just this guy. Who knows? Yeah, well, who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's not like I'm, I wasn't expecting much consistency from this show. He's just coming to terms with the facts. That maybe he really is a car otaku because like the cringe mobile driver guy is like explaining to him that, you know, all the things he was avoiding and all the things he was doing and trying to make him remember all the times they had driving around in his cringe mobile. Yeah. And going to hangouts with other cringe mobiles. And, I, and he's just starting to remember. But then Slayer comes in and Slayer comes in in her anarchy outfit, the one we've seen in the, in the, in the OP. Yeah. So I was right about her. She's somehow connected to anarchy. So it's not a coincidence that she looks so much like anarchy because anarchy gets all like, what is this feeling? When yeah. She shows up. Yeah. She's like actually like struggling to stand when she looks at her and it gets a headache because like she makes her feel something weird. The other two girls, it doesn't, it, that doesn't happen to them. It only happens to anarchy. Yeah. But yeah, so she's like absurdly OP and she almost kills them all. And just as she's about to kill them as they're all like crouching, Cringerbill driver guy drives his Cringerbill into her and like she's stuck on the hood and he like drives her away a little bit and you know makes his little speech about how he really wanted to take Anarchy for a drive but he guess 
I guess is that like she'll have she'll have to do. No, it was you'll have to do partner and and his partner's head from oh, when right. he was defeated in his mech is on the passenger seat and that's he's right. so just like talking about it so like dramatic romantically as <laughs> as they explode off into space and I, I I thought that was actually really pretty funny. <laughs> but yeah, that's that episode. There's the dumb bondage, very long bondage scene, and then that fight, and also yeah, the the joke at the start about the nature reserve and it's again this is just like the nonsense shenanigans this is exactly what this show should be it's not good but this is what it's supposed to be yeah it's not a show we would like but it'd be a show that we could understand was competent for other grosser people yeah yeah in the first episodes when the show wants to be sincere even the people who watch it don't want that because they all the people who defend it are like, just ignore that part. Don't worry about that part. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to pretend it doesn't exist. You're not supposed to think about things. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess hopefully this show would be the one that they were looking for or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, but fuck them because episode four. <laughs> yeah. So. We knew it was going to involve swimsuits from the preview. So I was like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We knew it was going to be a swim meet and stuff. And like. Okay, so again, it opens with like just sort of shenanigans, and like there was like okay, there's one dumb romance moment between Anaki and Otaku Hero, which is just like oh, sh- shut up. Yeah, they do it again. Yeah, she's feeling weird about the last battle, and he comes over, and she was like, "Did you come over to check on me? You don't need to do that, Baka." But I feel better now, and she's blushing, and he's blushing, and like oh, shut the fuck up. Boop, 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 boop. And the gag being that he actually came over to ask her to magically fix a toy of his. But he has enough tact to recognize this is not the moment. So he goes and asks for Pink's help in- instead. Now, again, Pink gag that I kind of liked. She, this isn't the gag I, I don't liked. remember this. She's explaining why the, the thing broke about like how plastics, you know, tend to sort of petrify over time and they become brittle and snap. She mentions the word stiff and then Blue hears the word stiff and gets really horny and it's told off. <sighs> As a traditional, there's so much of this in the first like 10 minutes of this episode of just Blue hears a word. Like they're really not trying at this point. Yeah. So fucking lame. Like, it just... I know we, we've talked about this, like, plenty in the first, especially in Ep 2, but, like, it's such an annoying joke. Because it is, like, aside from the fact that it's dumb and horny, it's also just... It's just dumb. No, yeah, it's like any gag that you went back to 20 times per episode would be bad. Yeah. Like, regardless of the fact that it's also gross and uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and it's, it's also, like, just imagine, like, imagine having a friend who said that's what she said sincerely trying to make you laugh at the actual, like, in you know, the, the innuendo. <laughs> just constantly. Yeah, but constantly. Like, it's just, it's annoying. Like, it's, this is the thing an annoying person does. Like, that's what someone does. They're trying to annoy you. It's so fucking lame. Anyway, the gag I liked was that Pink injects the toy with, because like, she mentions that, like, chemical magic is her specialty. So she injects the toy with this stuff, and the toy becomes all new and shiny again. But then because she added some other weird shit, the toy becomes sentient and leaves. <laughs> Which I was like, oh, funny, we all could do that. <laughs> Just get up and leave the show. <laughs> See, I, I, I didn't parse it as it becoming sentient. I thought it was just like flying randomly. Well, like the the eyes light up and it just gets up and like it stands up, it sets the boot, this little jetpack off and it just flies out the window. Yeah, that is hashtag relatable. I thought of sentience because like as after it was flying off at one point when it runs out of juice, it kind of just makes this weird sort of face. <laughs> I was like, I think it was briefly alive and just wanted to get away. <laughs> yeah, this is your child. <laughs> Anyway, Otaka here chases the thing and they end up on this bridge and this bridge just happens to be run by a bunch of old men Otaku, like middle-aged dudes who are also Otaku. Yeah, so they have like rival gangs in this area, it turns out. Yeah, even though like apparently Otaku here and the Magical Girls are like basically responsible for this place existing. These Otaku are like, fuck you guys, Magical Girls are a scourge, we really hate you. And I'm like, oh, that's, it seems odd. I mean, like, you know, they're old men, so at one point Blue says, I like old man smell, and was told to shut up, and I'm just like... <sighs> yeah, I don't know if you got to where they explain the issue with these magical girls. No, I I picked up from you later on, there's like some there's some other otaka culture stuff. Yeah. I Yeah, I, don't, I think that was after the point where I turned it off. But this is a gag that I liked at first, but I should have been more wary. Yeah, these are a bunch of, like, middle-aged men who are, like, wanting to fight these you know, magical girls and stuff. But then two kids show up who are the children of these men who have been sent by, you know, the men's wives to bring them home because they're just fucking around in the otaku, pres- you know, preservation zone instead of, like, you know, being parents. Which is very weird because it's like, okay, so is it no longer, are we no longer worried about the whole the government captures otaku? They're just not doing that anymore? <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, th- th- this is the thing. Like, now that we're in- existing in this much sillier sort of version of the universe. I guess, yeah, don't think about the first two apps. Just don't think about it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, of course. Yeah, like that's, it, this is incongruous with the first two apps because they're, like, like you've said, that just shouldn't have been the first two episodes of the show. Yeah. Because it ruins everything. But 
okay, if we're working in this silly universe, is this, if this is what the show is supposed to be. I don't mind that as a joke. It's like these dudes are just shirking their responsibility to come be nerds and their kids are here to say, can you please stop calling me the name you tried to call me, which is like some anime character from well, well before I was born. It's dumb. See, it was pissing me off because I remembered the whole like he wanted to show the good sh- side of otaku or whatever <laughs> that quote was for this show. <laughs> he wanted to really celebrate it. And so it's like, oh yeah, here's a good side of otaku. These guys d- don't care about their children. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how from someone's perspective, this is this idea of ribbing otaku, you know? Yeah. Like sort of going, ah, ha, ha, they're silly. This is this, we, we can make fun of ourselves type stuff. Um, and then the rest, like, okay, well, let's just get to what happens, shall we? Can you, can you tell us what yeah. happens? Yeah, the reason they're here is that the mecha figure went into the river and Otaku Hero wants to retrieve it. But these guys say, no, the river's ours. When we originally were getting taken over, we threw all our shit in the river. And now the river is like a sacred zone of all of our shit slowly going to waste and getting ruined by river water. So don't touch it. it that's ours. And so they decide to have a swim meet in the river with like different swim games to decide if they get to go in the river or not or whatever. Yeah. And this is Blue's idea because Blue has some quote about how skin to skin contact brings people together or something. Yeah. Because she's horny. Yeah. For some reason, the magical girls get to participate and they, you know, all have their swimsuits, of course, their sexy swimsuits. Of course. And for some reason, the children of the men have to participate in the role that the girls have. And there's one young girl and one little boy. And the joke is that the little boy is in a little girl swimsuit and all the men are aroused by that. At first, the gag is just that the boy is in the girl swimsuit and he's very uncomfortable and asking, why do I have to wear this? The men aren't immediately horny for that. But the very first thing that happens is an obstacle course race. And it's Blue versus this boy. And like Blue, Blue is like right next to the boy and he's wiggling a butt around and being super sexual and it's gross and I don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. And then Blue gets halfway and she just starts being absurdly horny. She has a hand on her crotch that's going up and down. Yeah, yeah. she is like actively masturbating. Yeah, she is masturbating as she like screams about how everyone is looking at her and she's so embarrassed and like there's shots of the boobs and it's very glossy, like it's drawn in a very porny way. And then it cuts to the boy and the boy is drawn exactly the same way, making a sexy pose, also talking about how he's so humiliated by, by all this. Yeah, but I mean, like, he's actually humiliated. He's actually humiliated, yeah. but he's talking about it in this, like, the, the actor is pulling this, like, soft tone. It is played like a piece of Shotokan porn, and that is the moment where I just said, I just quit, and I turn it off, and I, I, I wasn't going to watch another second of this fucking show yeah and the joke is, is that to uh, all these middle-aged otaku the boy is sexier than her and the end is more exciting for them i didn't get to that bit i didn't see their reaction to it because they were nose bleeding like crazy over blue yeah they all go and and that's how he wins the round is because he was way sexier than she was yeah i'm i'm just like this is where your thing about this being a psyop this is like the convincing moment for me this is this is you know my my third eye has opened <laughs> I have yeah, taken the red no, pill. No, otaku are all pedophiles. That's what this show is telling us. That's the joke. Like, how is that the joke? Hey, here's my son. My son that I put in a sexy little girl's outfit. Oh, we're all very aroused by it. That, that's the thing as well, that it's like, it's this kid's dad. You know, the people who usually the offenders in these sorts of mm-hmm. real life situations. And he and all his friends are very aroused by this sexualized little boy. How is this the joke? Ha uh-huh. ha ha ha. How? Ha uh-huh. ha. What like what? What are we doing? Oh, well, it's a joke because like you'd you'd assume normal men, right, find women sexy, but because they're otaku, they find little boys sexy. Ha 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 ha. I'm just it it legit kind of blows my mind. Like it's like, it's, I mean, like, okay, uh, this this is unfair to the Ruby writers, but it's like Ruby writer. <laughs> to be clear. To, it, yeah, to be clear. It's like Ruby writer level of unawareness of what you are doing. Because I could understand the joke, like, the core of the joke is you've got this obviously sexual thing over here, which is very sexy. But the joke is like subverting expectations. It's this other thing. That shouldn't be sexy, but somehow that is sexier and that person wins. Because it's the thing you weren't expecting to be sexy, but it actually is sexy. But the, in this case, it's an eight-year-old boy who's been force femmed. <laughs> and it's like, and it's a bunch of middle-aged men who are doing the nosebleeds at a force femmed eight-year-old. Yeah, you understand everything about this. What's wrong with that? <sighs> 
I just want to show the good side of otaku culture. <laughs> even without all of that context, even without all of that stuff about like, on the one level, it's almost like this is like, this is like a 4chan edge joke. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say this goes back to my whole thing that like this is 4chan. Two, four, eight. What, like whatever you want to call it, but this is this is the Two sort chan, of yeah. This is the sort of like the joke you make to gross everyone out because you're so fucking edgy. But this is an anime that, like, other people, like, you had to make someone fucking animate this. You know what I mean? Like, this is a thing that goes, like, I know it goes on TV at 2 a.m., but it goes on TV. It goes on streaming services. Like, that sort of shit, like, it shouldn't be anywhere. But if it's going to be anywhere, it should be on some fucking hard-to-access forum for a bunch of gross fucking, like, weirdos. Yeah. This is just so beyond not okay especially combined with like the whole like i want a world where people are free to like what they like and stuff it just comes across as like those really pathetic guys on twitter who like make it their whole profile and stuff to be like i think lowly con's okay yeah and i'm gonna talk about lowly con all the time and if you don't want to talk about lowly con porn all the time you're pressing me yeah yeah that, that, it's, it really is like like you say this being the sire because like this is a type of a, of like nerd like gross far too online otaku, you a weeb, you will find. Like it's not like this is like some weird reality where like, oh well, you know, this would never happen in real life. No, 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 no. They're all out there. Yeah. They're all on Twitter acting like this is cool and, and insisting that this is cool. This is like just a thing that's that exists in real life. Well, that's why it's so cute and funny. <laughs> if you spent enough time like in anime circles on anime Twitter, at some point you will encounter people like this. And you need to ban them from your Discord. <laughs> like, like it happens. Because it's finally time for them to come out of the shadows. They've had to live unfairly, <laughs> you know, maligned. And now it's their time to be free to like what they like. I just, I just. I, finally, freedom. I knew the show was going to be gross, but I didn't expect this show to, <laughs> to like do no map gags. I just, I really was not expecting that. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not watching this anymore. I'm not, I'm, I, I don't know. Yeah. There's no reason for me to watch this show anymore. So I stopped. That's very fair. I'm, I might continue just to see if anything worthwhile talking about happens, but I will take that hit for <laughs> Fiend. Obviously, we've learned that we have different tolerances to different kinds of sexual animation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> like, I see it and like I'm like, yeah, it's fucking gross, but I'm more, I'm more just tired. I'm just fucking tired of, yeah. of these people, of these goddamn people. <laughs> that was kind of my reaction to the bondage scene was just like, oh, fuck's sake. Yeah. This is, this is stupid. This is stupid and I'm bored. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like, this, is, this sucks and it's gross, but I've been here yeah. and, I, and, I, and I hate it here. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot to talk about with the rest of the episode that you didn't see. It's just funny because I didn't actually hit the halfway point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm trying to remember the other things that happen because it becomes this whole conversation about older otaku versus younger otaku. And the older otaku are blaming the youngins for being too on main. And that's why they all got like slapped down and it almost starts to feel like they're referencing like you know some of the discourse that you'll hear among queer communities yeah about like you know you don't understand the real struggle that we had back in my day when we had to be secret about it and stuff and y'all are just you know blah 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 oh it feels God. like that except it's about lo liking stupid otaku shit yeah or oh, in this case, fucking, yeah, being pedophiles. I mean, the rest of, nothing else references that later in the episode, oh, okay. which is good at least. But, I mean, that's there. <laughs> <laughs> which does make the rest of the conversation, like, way goofier. Because it's like, oh, I had to do this in the darkness. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to consume your Shotokan shit in the <laughs> darkness. This is horrible for you, fucker. Oh, God. Putting that aside for a second, it is strange that... The yeah, they sort of slipped into a horrible generational queer discourse. <laughs> yeah, I was like, how is this happening? But about, you know, whether people sometimes make fun of you for <laughs> reading anime or whatever. Jesus. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I mean, again, it's like this show's attempted sincerity is about like, sometimes is about that this idea of what it is to be otaku and how it actually is like a struggle. Yeah, and it's like it's it's not it's it's not it, you are not oppressed because as as we said you are not oppressed because you like Sword Art Online. Yeah, it's just not a thing. And the men's kids come to appreciate why they're such nerds and understand that they have to live here in Nerdsville instead of uh, raising their goddamn children. <laughs> That is not, that is, that should not be the echo. That's pretty much the rest of the episode. There, there's nothing else worth talking about. It's just all about the, that relationship. And it's like, maybe young otaku and otaku, otaku will never really understand each other. Okay, bye. <laughs> right. That's cool. Yeah. 
So that's all horrible. But I've come now to a somewhat better understanding of how Inagawa Jun, the creator guy, got to be this way. <laughs> okay. And I dislike him greatly now <laughs> as a person. Okay. And I know he's just 22, so he's a young boy, but he's a bad young boy, and he needs to be better and go to his room and clean his room. <laughs> so Jun Inagawa is the son of a very wealthy car designer guy for Nissan. Okay. So he's very privileged. He's a rich boy. Okay. He's a... Fuck, he's a fail son, isn't he? So it's very funny because, like, he talks about, like, I've always wanted to be a mangaka and my parents told me when you're 18, we're not giving you any more money. We'll support you until you're 18 and then you have to make your own way in life. And so that's what I've been trying to do. So when I went over to this place in L.A., I told my dad, Dad, I need a $300 T-shirt to impress this skater guy. And he bought me the $300 T-shirt. <laughs> and then blah, 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 blah. So it... And, Apparently from like 12 to 18, they moved to America and he lived in San Diego. He talks about like how he would go between LA and San Diego like every day and all this stuff that's like very clearly like someone's funding all this. Yeah, yeah. He's not doing this with barista money. <laughs> yeah. But but it's funny because he was like, have you ever been to San Diego? There's nothing to do around there, which is why I sat around reading manga. Hey. There's funny aspects where the older he gets in these interviews, because you can find interviews from when he was like 18 through when he's like 22, 23. And he used to be what I think is more honest about what anime got him into anime, which is he says that the first thing that really awoke him was Kiss X Sister, which I assume you are not familiar with. No, I'm not. What's the go? Because it's a trash manga about a guy who has two stepsisters that are both in love with him. Of course. And it's, you know, just like corny, ha ha, ha, bullshit. And so this guy is like, that was my real big awakening. But nowadays, when he talks about his otaku awakening, he's like, oh, I liked this, you know, I liked Inazuma 11 and other kids manga. And I always was really impressed by those and wanted to be a mangaka. And I'm like, don't you fucking even pretend. (laughs) Don't you pretend. I saw you talking about Kiss (laughs) Exus. But that's the thing. He knows he can't bring that up because he'll get made fun of. Yeah. Being into the, the light incest. <laughs> I got into anime and manga in middle school. I especially love the manga series Kiss Exis. When I first read it, something knocked me awake like, this is it. I got infatuated from that point onwards. I discovered what sort of fictional world I liked after reading Hayate, the combat butler, and my obsession grew more. I read through the famous ones like The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Clan Ad, and Angel Beats, which, like... One, like, Haruhi is before his time. That's weird. And two, it's just like these, like, fucking basic ass, otaku ass, <laughs> dumb shit. He talks about love Hina, loving love Hina. And I'm like, really, dude? You're going back to read, like, the most generic harem manga possible? <laughs> that that's what you're going for? And oh, he loves Attack on Titan. Oh. <laughs> oh well, yeah. My eight year old cousin fucking loves Attack on Titan. He, he told me that anime all sucks except Attack on Titan. I was like, you're right, you're old. Yeah, that's the thing. Attack on Titan is, is so mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just thinking like, I begged my dad to divorce mum and remarry a woman who had two twins, possibly uh, my age or maybe slightly younger. Uh, but he said no. No reason, dad. No reason. <laughs> I was just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? I, I, I laugh at this guy, but then I think about how meters away from me, I have um, all eight volumes of Midori Days sitting in a closet. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't necessarily throw stones, but I guess, like, I never told someone in an interview. You also haven't then made a series that suspiciously has a lot of the gross energy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, I haven't told people in an interview that um, I liked the incest manga. (laughs) That's your main inspiration. Yeah. Jesus. So a later interview, some of these are just like, what a doucher. Like, I'm sorry, doobie. But, okay, could you start by introducing yourself to the to the network? I'm Juni Nagama. My job, I don't really know what to categorize myself as. I don't really feel right calling myself an illustrator because there are lots of people who make a living off of that. I don't exactly sell myself with my drawings. I sell my lifestyle. <laughs> so I guess I'd be a creator. Yeah, a creator, I guess. <laughs> I guess I can tell he spent a lot of time in LA. (laughs) He sells his lifestyle. What is your life? It's being an otaku. Yeah. It's just night liking nerd things. Yeah. (sighs) He's an influencer. Like he's a proto influencer. That's that's what he is. Uh, I guess shortly after he graduated high school, he went back to Japan because he really wanted to be a mangaka. And so he submitted his manga to Shonen Sunday to have them publish it. 
Ahem. But they told me, your illustrations are good, but there is no originality. You don't have enough experience. I was so frustrated. I felt so defeated. And I went to go see my uncle's friend who I've always been with since elementary. He's super into punk and skate and stuff. This guy was telling him, you know, like, you need to get more life experiences, basically. Mm. You only watch Japanese manga and anime, and that's your only inspiration source. Of course you're going to lack originality. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, good uncle. Yeah, real talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's how he got into this, like, s- punk scene or whatever. But that implies that he hasn't been in this, like, whole punk scene that, like, kind of defines his vibe until, like... Like, but I don't understand the timeline here. Because that would be, like, past 18, right? Yeah. And he's 22, like, now. So if he's hold, all defined by being up in the punk scene, like, w- was he in for, like, a year before that became his <laughs> defining thing? Like, he can't he can't be that, in, like, knowledgeable about it. No, but it's very early 20s to sort of, like, go, like, okay, this is my aesthetic now. This is what I'm into. Yeah. I suppose. I guess I don't want to get into a debate about authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> for something like that when you're still this young. So there's another story he tells where he wanted to learn about otaku culture because he was like, this is very mysterious. I don't know anything about it. And and he says that he like t- brought a, a tape recorder or not a tape recorder, but like some recording equipment and just like really talked to an old otaku about otaku culture. And that's how he learned all about it is like he interviewed this guy and then he's huh. like, that's me. I'm all into the otaku culture now. Like he wasn't before. It's very strange. I think he's like, he seems like someone who likes to self mythologize a lot, you know? So I don't know exactly how literally true some of these things are. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, again, you know, early twenties, doucher <laughs> who has no sense yeah. of self. I mean, I feel like this is the thing that happens with like particularly privileged kids sometimes too. Like their life has been very easy. Like the thing says, he has no life experience. There's nothing that really defines him. You realize you don't have an identity, and so you really have to quickly go and adapt, like pick one up. But he's just very blatant. He's kind of surprisingly blatant about that's what he did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he really does give you the impression that he thinks that otaku, it do- they should be able to be it more openly and not have to worry about it. And they're a little oppressed and, you mm-hmm. know, they shouldn't have to feel embarrassed. And I guess it's, I mean, that is the biggest oppression that he faces yeah, as yeah. this, like, like, kind of privileged looking guy is like, sometimes people laugh at me and we need to make a world where that doesn't happen. <laughs> One time he told someone that he liked that incest manga and they laughed at him. That's the thing, because it's not just that he likes anime or whatever, it's that he has shitty cringe anime taste. <laughs> like, he'll talk really proudly about all these things, that, like, about reading, like, eroge, like, um, you know, hentai games as a kid or whatever, oh, or, like, God. as a young teen, and be like, I got really deep into this stuff, like, this thing where these two girls combined, it was all fucked up, and blah, blah. It's like, oh, man, I wonder why people were fucking acting like you're a weirdo it must be because otaku are oppressed it must not be because you're super into hentai like really on main <laughs> you freaking grosso yeah this does explain a bit i guess yeah knowing that he's a, he was a privileged kid with no life experience yeah his influences are only the things he's seen and that's why he's just sort of regurgitating it there's definitely something a vibe you get from this show not only in the terms of the the magical girl stuff it touches on and his stated stuff about magical girls you get a similar vibe when you look at the sort of Itaki, you know, tchotchkes and, and items that you see in this. It's not someone who actually knows a great deal about otaku stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like he's definitely not someone who really knows anything or mu- much at all about magical girl shows. This isn't the sort of parody that's made by someone who's really deep into it and gets and can make a lot of references and gets yeah gets what's funny and what works and what doesn't in the genre. But I feel like you could probably apply that to everything otaku related in the show. Is that like you have these nerds and there's lots of jokes about the nerds and the culture, but there's not really any jokes about the actual content that's being consumed, when it, which is weird because the content is so central to everything that defines who these people are. Yeah, no, it's very surface level. Yeah, yeah. Like all of these people are just like, you're oppressed because of this content you're consumed, but there's no talk of the content itself. Like the, the little robot that he wants fixed is like a very generic looking, like a Gundam and or whatever. I mean, I don't know enough about those things to talk about that, but like, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the magical girl jokes are very shallow. All of the references to Otaka stuff is extremely shallow. It's just like body pillows and like Miku. Like, yeah. I mean, that matches with like all of his manga pulls for like what his favorite manga and stuff are just like super generic shit. Yeah, yeah. Like the- <laughs> it is the SAO oppressed person. Yeah. <laughs> You're not actually all that deep into this. You're not a person who can really, you know, make deep jokes about the culture. You just sort of, it's all 
I almost feel like he he seems to know a little more about the dynamics of the culture than he does about the actual stuff. But it's it's hard to even say because it's like he's you know like I just love Akihabara and I love its culture and stuff. But he didn't mm. live there, or he might have lived there briefly at some point. It's like I don't know the extent to which even he knows that much about it. It's interesting to bring that up because Lincoln in the chat, Lincoln, who's a member of the Discord, mentioned in the Slash chat the other day that they've been to Akihabara quite recently, and like Akihabara is so much more than just the otaku shit. Like, there's way more sort of cultural, different cultural scenes going on in that space than just nerds who want to buy girl dolls. Like, so it's sort of, it's almost insulting, like, to, to sort of make it, make the place just about those nerds. I do think it's fair that, like, that is the Akihabara thing. Like, when you step off the train, you know you are in Akihabara and, it, and there's all this nerd shit. <laughs> like, mm. it is the land of super nerd shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, lots of different nerd shit like just like how they have all those different nerds that you know are not not fucking present in these episodes i don't know if we had got a single fucking train otaku moment <laughs> those guys that you know they theoretically have these other interests but in the end they all just kind of vibe like they're anime nerds you know they yeah. all like sexy little boys they all like corny <laughs> magical girls like there's no feeling that they all have their own really distinct subcultures, which they do. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff that Lincoln was talking about was like the sort of those people who were into like really crazy fashion subculture. Yeah. Like really wild outfits and stuff. Or like some of it's like tech and music based as well. That's some of the stuff you find in Akihabara as well. So it's like, yeah, it's it, It's not just anime nerds. It's not just dudes who like, you know, gross anime girls on a body pillow. Like it's sort of, yeah. but that's all this show really wants to talk about, I guess, is, yeah. Yeah, when I think about Akihabara, I think of like, there's a lot of net cafes there, of course. Oh, Later of course. on, when I would go to Tokyo, like when I need to catch a flight or whatever, instead of staying at a hotel, uh, there's a particular net cafe there I would go to. Mm. And it, it was actually just like really pleasant. Like, it, you know, <laughs> the lights were always off and they had a free drink machine with like lattes and shit. Oh, nice. And you could use the shower or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I liked it a lot. And I, that's what I think of now when I think of Akihabara is just like, it's just this like kind of nerd, chill nerd plays in some places. Yeah. Like, you got the weirdos. I'd buy my manga screen tones there and whatnot. Yeah, Akihabara, pretty cool. You should go there sometime if you're a fucking nerd like us. It's <laughs> it's not all just uh, horny pedophiles, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, here's, here's the quote about him learning about otaku. I think the word otaku and street are overused today. Since I always use the word otaku and present myself as one, I felt like I had a large responsibility. So I reached out to one of this guy's friends, a diehard otaku in his 30s who lives in Akihabara. I had him teach me everything about otaku, otaku history. It was just like we're doing right now, like an interview. I brought a mic and all. I had him tell me everything from the 70s. That's how I learned everything about otaku culture. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much you could have learned in a day. And also, like... Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's probably interesting on a historical level, but I don't know that it actually, like... What stuff was like in the 70s and 80s probably isn't all that relevant to now. Maybe? I don't know. I don't, this is strange. Yeah, it's like you could learn interesting things, but I wouldn't say, like, now I understand otaku culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, these early 20s vibes of I went and stayed in Italy for two weeks and now I am Italian. Yeah. Like, it's that sort of, like... <laughs> it's that kind of thing. <laughs> You get back to America and just roll your ass all the time. This is silly. This is silly. He's a silly man. This is a silly man. He's a very silly boy. Yeah, yeah. And he's, but he got to make a show. But damn it, where is it? Ah, yeah. I'll try to remember it as best I can. But basically, he was just like, <laughs> I want it to be the kind of show that, like, if you're getting into arguments or something, you can watch it and just feel like everything's okay or whatever. <laughs> you know, like have a bright spot in your day. But also, don't get it wrong. There's a deep story <laughs> that you're you're gonna have to wait to find out about. Or something. Oh God! I mean, look, you never know. There may actually be some intricate plot stuff going on. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I mean, is in like I don't I don't know if it's gonna be any good, but there might be some absolute like you know wild bullshit that they've got planned. Please, I want the wild bullshit over what's going on right now. Please, <laughs> like g give to me the wild bullshit. Yeah, like at least eighty percent more wild. It's one of those things where like if we're spending two episodes just fucking about in like a twelve episode run, it can't be that wild because you don't need this much time to set it up. <laughs> clearly. You would think so, but then you have shows like, you know, like Yuki Yuna or whatever, who just decide to spend their time that way. That's true. <laughs> and then they go buck wild and don't spend the time on the things they really should have. Yeah. Yuki Yuna is sort of notable because it like, it they just introduce concepts very quickly with, with no setup. Yeah. Like the entire plan was for all of us to turn into wheat. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I still think about that sometimes. It's pretty good. The Taisha disbanded around the year X because ever, most of the members have become weed. <laughs> and I do wonder about the funding of this show because he refers to like, I don't get any money for the anime until it airs. And I'm I'm like, is he funding the show? Like, does this show only exist because like he or his dad was able to like front a bunch of the money for it? That's, yeah, that's interesting. I do wonder. Why would he not get paid if he's one of the creators until like the dis- distribution payments? Yeah, like I mean, I don't know what anime deals are usually like in terms of yeah. like what the artist gets, but it doesn't feel like you just get nothing until it airs. Like there should be some optioning money or something. Normally over here, if you were in part of developing the show, you would get like you would carve out a small part of the budget to pay yourself a wage. Yeah. Like, yeah, but like if he's only getting money once the distro rights come through, but like you said, we don't know how it works in Japan. Yeah. But I'm, I'm like, it would be really funny if this is just like paid for by him or his dad, and that's the only reason he gets to have his own show. I mean, <laughs> about Otaku Hero, about his OC, kissing all the girls. It would be really funny and quite sad. And, but like, also, I could see that. I mean, I'm, it wouldn't be the first time something like that has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez, that's sad. Um, and this is this studio is like a weird kind of like small studio where, you know, they had Ozer Lane and obviously, you know, where the money for that comes from. And so it looked decent. And then they had mm. the Dawnfall, which looked like shit. And who knows even what was going on with that? <laughs> like, it, it just seems like the studio where I could imagine someone being like, hey, I'll, I'll pay you a bunch of money if you make me or my son's <laughs> show about his OCs. And they're like, all right. <laughs> I guess that is the thing in terms of like, that's just sort of how the show gets made. Someone comes to you with, especially if it's a licensed thing, it's like someone comes to you with cash. Like I assume the BRS thing is still Good Smile, <sighs> like trying to find, make something work with BRS. I think so, yeah. And Disney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Regarding the future, yeah, Cube, we'll keep an eye on it. Maybe we'll do a wrap-up pod at the end. We can talk about what happened in the plot, I guess. But yeah, we're not, we're not covering this show anymore yeah i guess maybe something like super crazy insane and completely apart from this stuff happens next episode i might be like fiend are you sure you don't want to check back in (laughs) but otherwise i i would not even ask such a thing of her i can i can handle this (laughs) it's not just that it's gotten like particularly gross it's also that like the vibe we're getting from what we've seen so far in those two eps is that there's just not it's it's not like some of the other gross magical girl stuff we've covered where like there's just not going to be enough to talk about. Yeah, because these two episodes were just very gaggy and very, hey, we're all having a good time being nerds, being gross. Wee. Yeah, and repetitive in a way where it's like we're just going to be saying the same things over and over again. This isn't like Ruby where there's like new wild things we have to sort of unpack or no, oh, yeah, or any of the other sort of stuff we've covered where it's like there's or, or, or you know like say Demi Girl Next Door, it's just like we like talking about it. We don't you know we don't want <laughs> we don't want to talk about yeah. this. Yeah, blue girls horny. Oh, after. After you left, you completely missed the fight against the the robots. There's a tentacle robot. <laughs> You'll never believe the kind of things that happen with this tentacle robot. <laughs> You'll never guess the gags that are made. So instead, we have given you a taste of shit mahus. You know, we don't want to just cut you off, you know, cold turkey. <laughs> what we might do is finally get to the end of Magia Record <laughs> Season 2, that little four episode chunk that got released a while back i did re-download it because i couldn't find the episodes <laughs> i am ready to to dig back into that nonsense i feel like i might have to i was gonna say i might have to re-watch it but maybe i'll just re-listen to our episodes <laughs> and experience it that way that might be the better way to consume it yeah. yeah it's a show where watching it doesn't necessarily help you understand anything <laughs> this is true it was kind of the experience of watching it last time so yeah and he re-listened to you getting really mad about truck yachio that episode in particular was like i was so angry i didn't notice how drunk you were i was so like, drunk the end of the episode. i was like <laughs> <laughs> actually all right maybe maybe we it might be worth just addressing something else real quick as well because people still occasionally ask we are aware of what happened in ruby volume 9 we were sort of following recaps, and I think you might have watched the last episode. I watched like the last episode via clips, but long enough clips that I feel like I got all the important parts of what happens. <laughs> mm, yeah. So yes, we know we know what happens. They managed to get to levels of gross even beyond anything they've done so far in terms of things you should not be talking about and analogies you should not be making and you're all fucking criminals. Yeah, we're still not going to cover it. Maybe in like a few years if we've confirmed that it's never getting renewed, we could do like a <laughs> drunk recap of the whole season. What would have happened if we have had to kick cover it is there would have been an episode where we were both shit-faced. Absolutely. Because that's just that's the only way we would have coped. I was actually thinking if we if we ever do um manage to do our meetup in Japan, which we we're going to do in COVID year, but then you know COVID happened. Ah. If we ever do that, we sh- we can both get drunk and talk about Ruby V9 in person. Maybe we can do that. <laughs> That's the most important thing to go to Japan for. <laughs> <laughs> Look, as you have said before, it's the basis of our friendship. This is true. So, you know, it feels like it would be appropriate. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very mad about the suicide stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's fucked. 
and how it's handled. Yeah, yeah. Multiple suicides at the end of this season. And one of them is treated as a good, happy thing. Yeah, just the most horrific shit. And I, I don't like it. One, well, okay, like one it. stupid thing that happens that I want to mention just because it, it, it also happens in the Ruby Justice League movie that came out is that <sighs> we thought this was only a one off, like it was like a weird Oscar thing, but <sighs> <laughs> RT now three times have done this thing where there is an adult man in the body of a teen boy who is being shipped with a teen girl. Mm. Like, and, then, and like, by, by the time we get to Justice League, an underage teen girl. This has happened three times now because it, ha- it like, first of all, you know, you've got Oscar with Ozpin and his balls who's being shipped with Ruby. In volume nine, you had a thing where John went to the beach that makes you old. <laughs> and he lived several years. He's like middle-aged old man at the end of the season he gets like de-aged back to where he is but he lived all those years like he functionally mentally he's like in his late 30s yeah but because it's an anime and you know him as a teenager no his teenager is his true heart age don't worry about it so he's being shipped with weiss again including a moment where weiss finds middle-aged john hot or at least makes him more makes her all blushy yeah and then in the justice league ruby movie batman is being shipped with weiss and in this reality it's a show where Batman is like, yeah, he was thirty-five-year-old Ben Affleck, grunty Batman, and then, but now he's been, now he's a teen boy, and he's being shipped with Weiss, who in this is like Beacon Day, so this is Weiss under the age of eighteen. I'm not actually certain if it's Beacon Days. I think it's like right after they have split up or something, because she's back home. I'm not sure about that, because oh, okay. I mean, and it's a whole part of the thing that the canon is fucked up. That's like a canonical part of the movie. It's amazing. I, I, I fucking love it. It's like. Okay, so spoilers. The Justice League have been pulled into this weird simulated reality that is Remnant, but the canon is all fucked. Like, Oscar and Ozpin exist at the same time. The canon's all fucked up because the person making the simulation doesn't know Ruby that well, so everything's a bit off, which is funny because that's what happened in the first run of DC Ruby comics that was supposed to be canon. It was made by a person who didn't know Ruby very well, so the canon was all fucky. How did they do it? Why did they look at what happened in real life and go, yeah, that should be the plot of the film? Because they're kings, and that's like the one most amazing thing they could do, and I stand. <laughs> Don't stand them shipping adult men with teen girls, though. I don't care what body they're in. That's not what's fucking important, you goddamn weirdos. There's also a clip going around I've seen that just has annoyed Batman fans quite a bit, which is like, in this movie, Batman gets to be a Faunus again. And like, there's a whole thing about how he doesn't want to go back to the real world because he gets to be special and have superpowers here, um, which is not the case in really? the oh real world. Really? Oh my god. Yeah. And there's, just, there's all these Batman fans going, who the fuck is this? <laughs> like... As if Batman keeps... What version of Batman has ever given a fuck by... Like, it's one of those things where it's like, potentially that's something interesting to explore... But also at the same time, yeah, he had like it's assembling some bat wings. That's what he's got. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Just... Yeah, and he's just like a weird goof. And I saw the scene where like he starts flying and he's like, how does Clark do this so easily? You know, just like throwing around his civilian name like you do. Yeah. Like you do when t- you don't know anything about Ruby or DC superheroes. <laughs> it's awesome. But uh, we don't plan to cover that. No. I, I hope part two doesn't happen. I hope no more Ruby happens ever. It's, I'm praying. I'm praying to the God brothers who are no longer God brothers. <laughs> That, that, like, this, is, this is like what we explained last time. It's just like knowing everything that happened at RT, there's no fun to be had anymore. It's not fun. Yeah, this is fucked. It just sucks. Everything about it sucks. It needs to stop. There needs to be no more Ruby. Make, like make it all go away. Carrie, it's not imposter syndrome, Carrie. <laughs> you don't need to get over your imposter syndrome. That's not, that's not the issue, Carrie. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Never watch anything. No. No, yeah. Actually, I think you should do the opposite. I think you should have a nice anime. <laughs> <laughs>